I can do this alone. Get out of my way. I don't feel any pain anymore! Anytime is a good time to talk about Monica Magica once again, and today we'll be going over its most striking scene, the witch fight from episode 7 into episode 8. For an anime that showed off some very distinctive visuals with its main enemy, the witches, this scene is a sharp left turn, ditching most of the elements that were key to those previous fights. This marks the turning point in the anime, with the only remaining named witch fights being Sayaka herself and then Valpurgis Noct. It's safe to say this scene had to deliver as things amp up and the focus changes from magical girls fighting witches to them fighting their own failures. And it did. I'd argue this is one of the best scenes in anime from a technical standpoint, as well as overall one of the most memorable and emotional. So I'm excited to break down exactly why I think this and delve deeper into another of anime's greatest scenes. Also, I'll be summarizing a lot of what I discussed in my previous video on Sayaka, so it may be good to check out that from the card on screen before or after, but it's not necessary either. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. This classic quote from Antony de saint Exupéry sums up how this scene became such a mark of perfection. It took a formula that was developed in the episodes prior and simplified it down to just the bare necessities, flipping the script on most of them to create a distinct turning point. So to cover this scene, we first have to look at the witch fights that came before it and the key elements that composed those scenes. This isn't an exhaustive list, and I'm sure someone with more experience with this kind of analysis could find even more or do a better job, but these are the ones that I found. First and most obviously, we have the animation. One of the focal points of the series, it features an almost paper-like quality, like you actually cut these shapes out and made a stop motion that covered the key aspects of these witches' former lives. That in itself is very fitting, giving us a surface level of detail about these witches and leaving the rest up to a mystery. It's as if you actually cut out sections of their former personalities and pasted them in here. That in itself is a key aspect to highlight the use of specific imagery for each witch. So much so you might even be able to say these scenes are somewhat over-designed. They're very busy and full of detail that's never expanded upon or seen again. It's almost dizzying how much is happening, and you could never put any meaning to all of it. And that's likely the point, as Madoka and Sayaka face the dizzying reality of an entirely new world that existed under their noses. It's a confusing time with a lot happening, and that's very much mirrored here. A part of the same beast, but something else I'd like to call out by name, is the use of color. It adds to this fittingly over-designed feeling, with each witch tossing an excessive palette onto the screen. Despite being shells of their former selves, these characters are all vibrant and colorful, an interesting contrast to highlight just how odd this world is. The main characters maintain their usual animation, however, which is more than just a stylistic choice. As witches are the enemies of magical girls, it makes sense for them to be shown distinctly. These are two different worlds colliding, not a single one, at least not as far as they know. Now, it's not just the witches that have these distinctive animation choices. Each one is contained within a labyrinth, and that's something else of note. They don't just enter the world of these creatures and start fighting them, they first have to find them in hiding. Now, the witch from episode 4, Kirsten, doesn't feature a labyrinth which requires searching, uh, but that's the one that actually seeks Monica out, so that's more of its fault than anything else. It likely had one, but bypassed it to try and kill Monica. So, outside of that case, the anime is very clear to show its characters traveling long distances and genuinely searching as well, looking around corners and checking individual doors. Each witch is quite the task before they've even met. Naturally though, the fight is the hardest part of all of this. Most of this likely comes down to what looks cool, memorable, and engaging, and how they wanted to play around with the animation, and they sure as hell had fun with that and made a great product. But I want to note some of these specific choices in how they fight. On the side of the witch, there's usually multiple foes. I guess these would be the familiar, familiars, or instances of them, I'm not exactly sure, but what matters for us is that it's not one-on-one, -on -one, at least not the whole time. And on the side of the magical girls, every fight utilizes multiple weapons or attacks. Mommy uses her guns once and then throws them away. Homura has multiple, well, just straight up bombs, Sayaka calls multiple blades, and Kyoko isn't actually seen fighting a witch until the specific fight we'll be addressing here, so she doesn't quite count. They also all usually finish their foes with a bang, in Homura's case once again quite literally, but Mami and Saiki each utilize some fairly flashy finishing moves, if you will. 
Mami's even comes with a name, Tierra Finale, and Saika's with some cheesy one-liners. As a last small note, pay attention to the music as well. Most of these could be called fight themes for lack of a better term, using an upbeat tempo and dramatic or heroic tone. Nothing too much to note there, but I want to try and highlight as much as possible later, and this will become a small point. Plus, the tracks are all amazing, so I'll take any chance to talk about them, even if only for a second. But before we move on, I also want to stress that everything I say from this point on should be taken with a grain of salt. I can't remember where this is exactly from, but there's a quote that goes something like, Sometimes the tree is just green. It means that not everything in a story is imbued with some meaning, sometimes that's just how it is. Most famously for anime, we've looked at Anno's own claims about his anime Evangelion for this. And everything here could be very much the same. But I think there's some value in looking at everything with the potential to be meaningful, so that's what we're going to be doing moving forward. Would it be bad if I used my wish to help him out? My wish has been granted. There's no way I'll ever regret it. I can't remember what I thought was so important. What was worth protecting, you know? Now we can move on to the star of the show, both of the anime and this video. After seven episodes of mental torture, Saika breaks and unleashes hell on the witch Elsa Maria. This scene is striking, obviously in a very different way from the ones before it. It's much more minimalist, living up to the idea that perfection requires limitation. The almost craft-like animation of the prior witches is ditched, replaced with something entirely new for the anime. Where those scenes were full of detail, almost too much so, this one lacks most of it. Then encompasses the color, as your eyes have already seen, as well as the specifics that pertain to the witch. And there's a very technically smart reason for all of this. As the turning point of the series and of Sayaka's character, she is the focus. This is where we see the dead end of her path that's been talked about so much and know deep down that she's already lost. It's a very emotional idea and so it's a great choice to leave everything else out of the scene and boil it down to just Sayaka. Even the witch is really a nothing, literally, as it's just a mass of shadow that can form to whatever's needed. It has almost nothing about it where all the others did. There's no distractions, nothing else to focus on, just Sayaka and her tragedy. We can also mention the music for a second here in relation to this. But the other fights had more fight-relevant music, you could say. This one has Sayaka's sort of unofficial theme, Decretum. Having the music that's most distinctly her play here rather than an up-tempo fight song amps up the focus on her alone rather than anything else. The music directly tells us it's not really about the action, it's just about Sayaka. Now, simplicity for emphasis' sake is the largest technical aspect of the scene, but there's also many thematic ones. One of the bonuses of this style is how almost indistinguishable the characters are from this world, and more aptly, the witch herself. Her and Sayaka are both just shadows here, shadows of who they used to be. Just like the witch, she has nearly nothing left. On the path to becoming one herself, it becomes harder and harder to tell her apart from the thing she devoted herself to defeating. Mirroring this in the striking black and white is an excellent decision. Now, we do get one other color in the scene, and that's obviously red. As the only color present, I don't need to explain how it stands out. And it's no secret that the man nicknamed Arrow Butcher would want to make this scene as gory as possible, and it's a clear undercut to the already decimated magical girl framing the show uses for a maximum gut punch. But man, does it really stand out here at just the right time. Everything up to now has been cutesy or flashy attacks, finishing off bows in a way that accentuated the seeming glory of magical girls. But now it's just bloody repetition with literally nothing else, as the scene is simply red with nothing else. And attacks is something relevant to mention because bloody repetition is a fitting phrase for Sayaka. As we discussed in depth in her profile, to try and justify her wish, her own desires, and her want to be a good person all the same, Saika clamps down onto a harsh idea of justice where only the most pure are worthy. She constantly reaffirms this decision, repeating the same mistakes that others warn her against with reckless abandon. She charges in, makes a mess, and refuses to change her mind. So it's very intentional that all the flash is gone from her tactics here. Hack, slash, and repeat. She's doing the only thing she knows as her path continues to narrow, so like everything else, that's what's shown in physicality here. And it's just as fitting that there isn't a mess of familiars or extensions of the witch here, there's one single enemy to focus her attention on, and one thing she can repeatedly hack away at. Again, this is very much not just how she fights, but how she came to live. 
She defined herself around that singular and narrow idea of justice leading to her downfall. Kill witches and she can be a good person, so she locks onto that one singular thing, just like fighting one single enemy. I've said narrow path a lot because, as we've explained, that's what she was on. Here, that's not just a metaphorical statement, but a literal one. Remember how every other witch faded into a labyrinth where they had to be sought out through long and winding routes? That's something else that was simplified here. We jump straight to Sayaka and the witch with just one path ahead of her, the one to the witch. A witch that refuses to move as if fate itself was pulling her down that line. As a visual parallel, I love this. There's nowhere else to go. There's no other option. She limited herself down to the inevitable. So that's what we're shown. This also brings us back to one of the only specific details of the scene here, the statue whose arm they're fighting on. No, it's not a one-to-one -one with anything I could find, so more so than anything else here, take this one with a grain of salt. But the closest statue it resembles is one of Libertas, the Roman goddess of liberty. This is what the Statue of Liberty is, but also many others around the world as well. And I do think there could be more a reason for this than just looks. Liberty is loosely defined as the ability to do as one pleases. I probably don't need to belabor the point that Saika can't do as she pleases, once again going back to the narrow path that she crafted. But this is also true of magical girls in general. They get a wish granted, but at a steep cost. They're forever bound to their craft, seeking out grief seeds just to maintain their life. They can never give this up, so they can never truly do as they please. It's even more true for Saika, who forces the concept of an ideal magical girl onto herself, not even mentioning that her wish was made to do as she pleased and hoped that Kyosuke would love her back. Given that didn't happen and she's left with almost nothing but Monica, it's fitting that she'd make a bloody scene atop a statue meant to represent liberty. Sayaka, you can't fight like that. You gotta stop feeling the way you do, because it'll only bring you more pain. Why are you doing this to yourself? Why won't you trust me? Can't you see I just want to help you? The end of Sayaka's scene is also very unique. Every other witch's labyrinth fades out back into the real world quite calmly. This one, however, begins to crack and crumble before finally fading out as well. Naturally, this just creates a distinctive visual and accentuates her brutality, but it's far from just looking cool. Based on everything we've already covered, it's pretty clear Sayaka's world is crumbling around her. Just like this scene takes things away from previous ones, being a magical girl took everything away from her. So if she does the only thing she knows, reflecting her life in her combat, this world begins to crumble as well. The visual of her standing there, dead eyed while things crumble around here, is downright perfect for this, a very literal mirror to her situation that, like everything else, I completely adore. There's also one final note about this scene that extends into the rest of the anime related to the black and white. Most of her story past this point takes place in the real world, but from this point on, it never quite looks the same. Her scenes from here have color to them, but they're draped in heavy shadows contrasted with bright light, giving some resemblance to this scene and even to this witch who is just shadows. Specifically, when she hits her lowest on the train, it's completely grayscale. And that's because once this moment hit in episode 7, the turning point of her character, there was no going back. Her world and the world of a witch became a lot closer, a lot harder to tell apart. This black and white started to bleed out into the real world for her. She was already a witch and it couldn't be stopped. She just needed that one final push, and she was over the edge. Now, again, to belabor my point, all of this needs to be taken with a grain of salt. I didn't work on the anime, so I can't say how much of this was intentional, and how much was a byproduct of things that looked cool or similar decisions. But I think there's a lot that can be learned from these kinds of discussions that highlight technical elements, especially with their interplay with thematic ones. A lot of work happens in our brains that we're just not aware of. Humans are very visual creatures, and this kind of stuff lays the groundwork for what our minds will pick up on when we move back to active thought. It's like an ad for a drink using cool colors to make you think about that drink as cold and thus traditionally more positively. If you want to see some of how ads try to manipulate you, just check out color psychology just for a start. Uh, but back to how similar things are related here. If we see Saika on a dead end path, it starts a connection in our minds that her mentality is the same thing. As someone who covers a visual medium and one day wants to create within it as well, I think knowing how to use this to your advantage is an exceptional skill and can make the difference between good series and great ones. Obviously, Monica Magica is one of the greats. I guess this is also like an addendum to our early profile of Saika since it adds more evidence to claims I made there. 
And unless I solely focus on this stuff, it's hard for me to pick up on it as well. So it usually ends up in dedicated videos like this one. But having said that, once again, I'm sure there's something I missed here or something I got wrong. So let me know your thoughts on this down below as well. Comments really help out the channel in general, so I always appreciate them on premise, but they're also important for me to gauge how well I'm doing, especially on topics like this that I'm not as much versed in. And a lot of the time they provide some insight in things I missed in my takes, so I always appreciate them, especially on new videos like this one. But I'll stop belaboring the same point I've been making the whole video and rambling as I do and just leave you with some important links in the pinned comment to my Twitter, Discord where we have a new quiz bot and some new things going on there, but general hangouts with other fans of the channel, and most importantly my Patreon where right now you can get your name at the end of videos like these lovely people, and once we get some more people over there, additional benefits as well. But subscribe and another video on screen now, and I'll just say thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you again soon.